Good afternoon. My name is Gary McKee. I work in academic development and administration at Westminster Presbyterian Theological Seminary in Newcastle upon Tyne in the northeast of England. We are England's Presbyterian Seminary. And let me give you a warm welcome to our monthly lunchtime lecture to all the regulars, but especially if you're joining us from other parts of the UK or indeed the world. Please subscribe to our channel for future lunchtime lectures and other quality content. Now my subject today is lessons from the life and ministry of Benjamin Bailey, missionary to India, 1816 to 1850. So the subject once again, as it just comes up to the RF1, lessons from the life and ministry of Benjamin Bailey, missionary to India, 1816 to 1850. Why this subject? Well, as is often said, I married a girl. My wife is from Kerala State, Southwest India. And in early 2011, I visited a park in Kottayam, which is in Kerala. And there was a statue there of Benjamin Bailey, the man who translated the scriptures into Malayalam. This early evening trip was a break from me sitting on my mother-in-law's porch, reading about the doctrine of scripture with a view to preaching some sermons on that subject when I returned home. So I saw the statue and I thought, I salute you, Benjamin Bailey. Three years later, an opportunity arose for me to do a PhD in mission studies, and I took Benjamin Bailey and his ministry in Kerala from 1816 to 1850 as my subject. So I'd like to share with you some lessons from the life and work of this little known missionary. Firstly, I will give a brief overview of Bailey's life and work, and then draw some lessons from it. So first of all, an overview of Bailey's life and work. There was more to Bailey's work than Bible translation. His work as a translator, and as someone who constantly developed language and culture in Kerala, is better told by experts in that field. So I, so I propose sketching out other central aspects of his life and ministry. So first of all, let us consider Bailey's early life. Benjamin Bailey was born in November 1791 in Dewsbury, Yorkshire. He had what could be described as a basic education and then worked in the wool industry. A probable explanation for the enthusiasm of Bailey for overseas missionary service was the influence of his parish minister in Dewsbury, the Reverend John Buckworth. Buckworth was a constant source of encouragement to his young parishioners to consider world mission. He had given training in Greek, Latin and theology two nights a week to those whose character and gifts he considered suitable for Christian service. With Buckworth's blessing, Bailey was sent in 1812 to train under the Reverend Thomas Scott. Scott had been a Unitarian and through the influence of John Newton and others was converted and came to evangelical and reformed convictions. Scott tells the story of his conversion in the force of truth. Scott proved to be an able mentor 
to Bailey and others. The regime Bailey faced under Scott would have included studying Bible exposition, divinity, mission history, and various languages. So from these snapshots of Bailey's seminary instruction, we can certainly get a picture of the influence that would have went with him to the mission field. For one thing, there would have been a strong strain of evangelical Calvinism. There would have also been a commitment to Episcopal churchmanship, which was a commitment shared by the ancient Syrian church in Kerala. Bailey was ordained on December the 17th, 1815, by Archbishop Harcourt in York. He served a brief curacy under Buckworth's supervision at Harwood near Leeds, but this was to be short-lived as on April the 30th, 1816, Bailey was formally sent out at the annual meeting of the Church Missionary Society. During these brief few months since his ordination, Bailey had married Elizabeth Ellen, and they then set sail for India on May the 4th, 1816. The Billies arrived there on November the 19th, 1816, and so began Billy's work alongside others in the so-called Mission of Help to the Syrian Church of Kerala. So secondly, let's consider Bailey and the Syrian Christians of Kerala. You may not know that there have been professing Christians in what is now Kerala state in southwest India since the very early days of church history. In fact, they trace their origin back to Thomas the Apostle. At least since the 6th century, these Christians have become attached to various branches of the Syrian Orthodox Church and therefore are known uh, as Syrian Christians, to which I shall refer to them in this lecture. Over the centuries, many traditions developed from inside the church and outside in Hindu culture, which in some ways weaken this church's witness and commitment to the pure gospel. And yet a flicker of light remained. There were those who over the centuries maintained a pure commitment to Christ and longed for better days for their church. The Church Missionary Society or the CMS was founded in 1799 by a group of evangelical Anglican clergymen and lay persons. From 1813 onwards, they began to turn their attention to India. Seven years previously, Claudius Buchanan, one time curate of John Newton, had visited what is now called Kerala. He had heard rumours of an ancient Christian church there. As he travelled through the backwaters, he had great delight as he saw white buildings glistening in the sun, which were clearly Christian places of worship. He recorded his meetings with the bishops and clergy of what was the Indian wing of the Syrian church in a book entitled Christian Researches in Asia, which was first published in 1811. Buchanan was a great publicist and lectured widely in the UK on missionary themes. As a result of this and other factors, it was proposed that a mission of help would be arranged to this ancient Christian church. The purpose of this mission was to help the Syrians reform themselves, not to set up Anglican churches in Kerala. Their hope was that this church would then become the great missionary force in India. The early years of the mission saw good relations between Bailey and his fellow missionaries and the senior ecclesiastical figures of the Syrian church. Bailey would preach in their churches and he began what was really his enduring legacy, the translation of the scriptures into Malayalam. 
Bailey, however, was quickly relieved of any illusions he held about the Syrian church. Bailey's realism about the Christianity he encountered amongst them comes out as early as 1817 in letters to Josiah Pratt at the CMS headquarters in London. He wrote, for example, concerning the Syrians, their church once flourished with pure evangelical truth, but how is the glory of it departed? They are now declined into the mere formality of religion, and I fear very little, if anything, but the name of Christianity remains amongst them. Far from being a means for converting their non-Christian neighbours, Bailey increasingly felt that the bulk of the Syrians needed converting themselves. A letter back to London again in 1827 expressed his burden. Though at present we see but little fruit issuing from our neighbours, we trust that he will make bare his holy arm and be glorified in the conversion of many around us from the error of their ways. Bailey continued working toward this end until he went on furlough to England in 1830. He would return to Kerala in 1834. Not surprisingly, tensions between the CMS and the Syrians soon surfaced, and in 1836 these came to a head. At a synod held by the Syrian church on the 19th of January, formal cooperation between them and the CMS came to an end. The reforms proposed by the missionaries were vetoed, and the missionaries were forbidden to preach in Syrian churches. For Bailey, this was no doubt devastating, yet he continued with his work of Bible translation and also disseminating other materials for the benefit of the Syrian Christians. So thirdly, in relation to Bailey's work, let us consider Bailey's influence on the church in Carroll. It may seem that Bailey's work was something of a failure. Yet we shall see now that after the end of the so-called Mission of Help, Bailey did see the work of Reformation done, both within the Syrian church and in the formation of Anglican parishes in Kerala. Bailey agreed to help oversee a small number of Syrian Christians who felt they should leave the Syrian church post-1836. By 1843, Six church buildings had been erected for Anglo-Syrian Christians and converts from the surrounding population. Perhaps the most notable congregation was what became the Holy Trinity Cathedral in Cottium. This was Bailey's own pastoral charge. And Bailey reflected at this time, I am now the oldest missionary engaged in the service of the CMS having first come out in 1816. When I look back on the length of time during which I have been engaged in the sacred ministry and see to what little purpose I have labored, I have reasons to be deeply humbled. I cannot, however, refrain from just alluding to three important objects which the Lord has enabled me to accomplish in the prosecution of my missionary labors. Firstly, the translation and printing of the whole Bible into Malayalam. Secondly, the translation and printing of the Book of Common Prayer, now in use throughout our Malayalam mission. And thirdly, the building of a neat and substantial church. These were, of course, no small achievements. Bailey had inculcated a submissiveness to scripture that would not allow a significant number of Syrians to settle for the status quo. That reform continued to bear effect inside as well as outside the Syrian church. These Christians, as one writer says, had learned from the missionaries 
to test all things by the Bible and had in consequence repudiated many of the ideas and ceremonies which had become customary in the church. As Bailey was translating the Bible, as well as preaching in Syrian congregations, we can make the case that he was a hugely significant figure in these ecclesiastical developments. It was Bailey who drove the process of getting the Bible into the hands of the people. He also translated works such as the Catechism of Isaac Watts and the Westminster Assembly, presumably the Shorter Catechism. So in this way, biblical truth was diffused among the people and God's word did not return to him void. Fourthly then, a word about Bailey's sufferings and trials. Benjamin Bailey's achievements came at considerable personal cost. Bailey was the father of nine children. Their first child was born shortly after their arrival in Kerala on December the 3rd, 1816, and only survived four days. This was the first of four such bereavements Benjamin and Elizabeth Bailey would endure. In addition to these bereavements, the Baileys also both suffered from serious bouts of ill health throughout their time in Kerala. When Bailey was still in his early 30s, he reported in 1822 that he had been suffering from severe bouts of sickness. These continued for both him and Elizabeth throughout their time there, and yet he was willing to submit to God's purposes in these things. Bailey wrote, whether he see good to perfectly restore it, talking about his health, or still to continue his inflicting hand upon me, may all the strength he imparts to me be spent in the service of my blessed Redeemer. Benjamin Bailey would retire from the mission in 1850, and as he headed for home, he probably couldn't have anticipated much future usefulness. Yet he would spend a further 20 years as a parish minister in rural Shropshire. He died there in April 1871 in his 80th year. So that's a bit of an overview of Bailey's life and work. But secondly, let us consider the lessons from Bailey's life and work. Although Bailey obviously, like us all, was a man of his historical moment, there are nevertheless various lessons we can learn from him wherever we are placed today. And these certainly aren't a full-orbed uh, treatment of his legacy, but they are three, I think, fairly practical lessons that we can we can take away for ourselves. So firstly, the need for perseverance. The need for perseverance. John Tucker was a fellow missionary to South India, and he described Bailey, quote, as not of brilliant talents or peculiar gifts. Now, I personally would question that. Someone who was able to translate the scriptures into Malayalam in a, in a way that actually was recognized as influencing on, on the language as a whole. Someone who was able to build a printing press uh, obviously had some talents and gifts. It's hard enough uh, for us today to set up YouTube channels and things like that. So it's, it's, it's quite, uh, quite special what Bailey was able to do. But I think the point is that Tucker saw perseverance and prudence as making up 
for his lack, perhaps, of brilliant talents. The printing press, his scripture translation work, and the church he built in Codium are testament to his perseverance. His work in printing and translating, for example, was undertaken despite the fact that he had very limited resources to learn the Malayalam language. And yet within five years, he had mastered the language and begun scripture translation work. Bailey struggled to acquire a printing press, but after five years had constructed a wooden one himself. And then the problem was finding a font of Malayalam type. After a type was cast for him at the government foundry in Madras, the forms of the letters proved to be useless. So Bailey, not deterred, and armed only with an encyclopedia and a small book in printing, formed his own font of Malayalam print that was described as extremely beautiful and correct. Miss Sarah Tucker, probably a daughter of John Tucker, wrote in her South Indian missionary sketches, how pleasant it is to see a mind thus overcoming difficulties which appeared almost insurmountable. And this not so much by any sudden exertion or feeling of enthusiasm, but by steady, well-directed, persevering effort. Bailey was a man of admirable perseverance. Second lesson is the need for both theological clarity and missiological strategy in cooperation with other churches. And this is a crucial lesson from the mission of help as a whole, and indeed there were various missions of help to ancient churches in the Middle East and in the Far East, other parts of the world. Bailey and his colleagues do not seem to have adequately understood the vital doctrinal differences between themselves and the Syrians. Undoubtedly, Claudius Buchanan was to blame for this. He had written in his Christian researches that Quote, the doctrines of the Syrian Christians are few in number, but pure, and agree in essential points with those of the Church of England. Unquote. Other evangelical Anglican missionaries, and missionaries from other denominations in India at the time and subsequently, however, seem to recognize more clearly the fundamental nature of the differences between the CMS missionaries and the Syrians. While they had great respect for Bailey and his colleagues, it nevertheless seems that they doubted if the mission of help had proceeded along a wise course. For example, the missionaries had set up a college for training the clergy of the Syrian church. The college that the missionaries were involved with uh, eventually became known as CMS College. It's more of a a liberal arts college today. I don't think there's any theology taught there. But Richard Collins, a former principal of the college from just after Bailey's era, wrote in 1873, never was there a greater mistake. It is difficult to avoid the conclusion from the records that remain that a too timid policy shackled their early efforts. The errors of Syrianism were allowed, nay, kept up in the very college itself. For Collins, it was praiseworthy that the missionaries had proposed to conquer the Syrians, I'm quoting here, by love and by ignoring all claim to any authority over their church matters. This was no doubt a laudable theory, but whether when the theory was reduced to practice there were not some unfortunate compromises which resulted in the strengthening rather than the elimination of error may well be questioned. Today, 
we need clarity in partnering with other churches for mission on whether or not they do truly hold to the pure gospel and whether we agree on other important doctrinal matters. So I haven't had time to mention, and I can't mention today, the, the Christological differences, for example. Yet while mistakes were made by Bailey and his CMS colleagues, surely there is a challenge in their desire to reform an existing church that had become largely nominal. Like Bailey, we need to ask, is there a way such churches can be brought back in line with the gospel? Do we see nominal Christianity as a missiological challenge? What if these churches were brought back to the Bible, were, were reformed? Then the places where they were situated would again have a gospel witness. So we cannot tolerate other gospels. We cannot formally work with such churches in some false ecumenical way that suggests we all believe the same thing. Yet may there be some informal contact that seeks to engage these churches. I raise these questions. I don't claim to have perfect answers to them. But the lesson here is there needs to be theological clarity, but also missiological strategy. And the last lesson then, as I close, is the need to be concerned for the ultimate good. This phrase, the ultimate good, is taken from Billy himself, who wrote to the East India Company resident in Travancore, we are anxious for the diffusion of knowledge generally and shall be glad to do all in our power for the amelioration of the temporal and everlasting condition of all castes of the natives. While we are principally affected by the ultimate good into which the Christian religion introduces its disciples, we are not ignorant or careless of the innumerable temporal blessings which accompany it and are anxious to behold that improved state of society which Christianity never fails of producing. Bailey's influence on the cultural transformation of Kerala was significant through his work as a Bible translator and his linguistic work more generally. The Malayalam spoken and written today owes a considerable debt to Bailey. Yet, this was a byproduct of his main mission, which was to ensure that through having the scriptures in their own language, both Syrian Christians and Hindus of all castes experienced conversion. In this way, they were introduced to the ultimate knowledge, the ultimate good of the knowledge of God and the hope of eternal life. In today's discussion on the mission of the church, Billy and his CMS colleagues provide an example in mission priorities. Other benefits of missionary endeavor are to be celebrated, but the ultimate good must remain the priority. In his centenary history of the CMS, Eugene H. Stock would write on the Great Commission, it is humiliating to think that this one Great Commission, which the Church's risen Lord gave her to execute, is the very thing she has not done. She has cared for the poor, the sick, the infirm, the young. She has taught the world to build hospitals and schools, but her Lord's one Grand Commission she has almost entirely neglected. Well, that was written in 1899. Benjamin Bailey certainly did not despise these goods following from mission. He positively welcomed such developments. The mission of Bailey 
and others moved Kerala away from feudalism and eventually to 100% literacy. Yet Bailey never lost sight of ultimate realities. He longed for the conversion of the masses of Kerala and his sufferings, heartbreaks and persevering labours all were considered worthwhile for the eternal spiritual profit of those whom he served. And so it ought to be in mission work any anywhere and any time. So let us pray. Father, we do thank you for your faithfulness in preserving your church and also in providing faithful men from generation to generation to seek to fulfill the Great Commission by building the church, by the translation of scripture and the preaching of it, and the establishing of churches and their reformation. And we do pray, therefore, that you would grant us perseverance and wisdom in all our relationships and wisdom to prioritize the ultimate good of knowing you in our mission. So we ask these things for Christ's sake. Amen. Please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I hope you have found this lecture helpful. You'll find links on the YouTube channel to our website and Twitter and Facebook profiles. And please also let us know if you want to receive updates about our seminary. You can contact me. My email address is given on this channel information. And you can also contact us via our website. We hope, God willing, to do this again next month on the 20th of May at 1 p.m. British Summertime. And our graduate, the Reverend Nathan Hilton, will speak on Robert Bruce and the Lord's Supper. Thank you for listening today and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.